Well, at this point, my home grid has a file, an auth server, and a terminal. Uh, the next thing to add is a uh, CPU server. Uh, this case will be sort of the original intent of the CPU server concept as a machine meant to specialize in compute intensive work. For a quick history lesson, the way Bell Labs envisioned Plan 9 was along the lines of what we now call thin clients. Uh, but at the time, this is already kind of an established norm. The difference was the norm was text-based consoles all wired into a central mainframe or time-sharing system. As I mentioned at the beginning of this series, the other track the computer world went down was personal computers and workstations, where everyone had a computer, storage, and interface all in one machine administered individually. Uh, the developers of Plan 9 blended some of this. Uh, the terminals did do some local processing, but they had pretty meager CPUs. Uh, the original ones were actually Motorola uh, 68000 series, and then eventually migrated onto you know the Intel x86 PCs. Um, and they lacked local storage because they would use the centralized file server. For tasks that required more CPU power, they added the CPU server. Uh, this kind of worked like the old time sharing systems where you could remotely issue a command to run a program, but the CPU server would also share the same central storage used by the terminal. Um, and the early on, these machines were multi-processor uh, MIPS machines from Silicon Graphics. So for now, I'm going to be using this as my CPU server. Um, I do have something a bit more powerful on the way, but it hasn't arrived yet. So for now, I have one off my stack of used Dell Optiplexes, this little small form factor thing. Um, it's basically sort of like the other stuff runs kind of a laptop CPU. It's a quad core thing. Um, since I'm going to be booting off the network using uh, Pixie and using the file storage or the file server as storage, there's no hard drive, no NVMe. Uh, all I'm really concerned with is that it has a CPU and some RAM like built into there. Um, so yeah, this will be used for now for my CPU server uh, demonstration. The setup of the CPU server will share some similarities with the terminal. It will not use any local storage and will use Pixie to load a kernel off the network. Uh, after that, it will connect to the file server and any programs and data it needs will be pulled from there. Um, so it will need some local storage and what that'll be for is um, when it boots, it's going to want a name and a password because um, there's going to be a you know host owner of the system. Um, and so I plan on having this thing run headlessly, so there will be just a thumb drive plugged in for that. Um, so here's my NDB local, where I have the MAC address. I'm gonna call the machine extra CPU. It'll be assigned an IP address. And for purposes of Pixie booting, there's the uh, little Pixie booting uh, program that'll be issued to it. Um, and then it will need an entry in uh, config pixie. So again, a file named with the MAC address of the machine, and this will behave like the plan 9.ini, the initial configuration uh, during boot. So it has the kernel will be running, the location of the NVRAM. So SD is for storage device, the U means it's USB, and then every sort of USB thumb drive has some sort of unique number. I had to go fetch that, and uh, the NVRAM is a tiny partition on that uh, thumb drive. The so service is going to be CPU, so that's kind of like the file server. That means it's going to be um, not running any sort of graphical interface, but instead open up network listeners for remote connections. I'm going to specify the user it's going to run as, so this is, will also have the same um, Glinda as the uh, owner of the system. So no boot prompt means it won't actually stop during the boot, ask what I want to do, it'll just automatically boot TLS, so it'll make an encrypted connection to the file and auth server, exchange the passwords and set up. Uh, did put in the entries for monitor and mouse um, in case I need to hook a monitor and a mouse up to it. So the first time the CPU server boots, it's going to need the username and the password to store in NVRAM. After that, it'll just sit there uh, like the file server. So, Glenda is going to be the ID. Uh, my auth DOM is going to be home grid. 
I have no sex door key. I'll put in Glenda's password. Confirm it. So I'm not going to use the legacy authentication system. And now it will connect to the file not server and finish booting. And there it is. So now it's just going to sit here sort of like the file server did with just a prompt. Uh, it does have access to the file server though. So I can see the stuff in Glenda's home directory because right now it's booted as user Glenda. But yeah, it's just going to sit here. Um, the thing expects to run sort of headless and uh, it ran the CPURC uh, initialization script to turn on network listeners. So for that, I'll go over to the terminal and demonstrate that. So here I am at my little thin T terminal. It's just two cores. I can ping the extra CPU to see if it's on the network now. And there it is. So to use it, you can just use the CPU command or RCPU in the case of nine front. I have to put H as the host, and I'm going to use extra CPU. You can see the little prompt change to CPU. So now anything running on that window there is actually going to be processed by the CPU server. And the little stats here. This top one here is the load, that's the CPU. So if I do something kind of intensive like Doom, can see it load up and we can see it spike now loading up the CPU on the terminal here. So supposing I wanted to do something that was CPU intensive but a little much for the terminal. Well I could go over here and I could run Doom in this window. And so you can see the CPU load over on the, uh, the terminal now is pretty minimal. All it really has to do is handle the actual display of the graphics. Uh, everything else going on the background is handled by the CPU server. So to show that, I can actually run a nested Rio in this window. Open the stats here. You can see now it's running on extra CPU with its four cores. Oh, and as a fun one, the uh, the CPU server has a speaker hooked up to it, so I should be able to bind in. Uh, let's do before the audio device into this namespace. So normally when you do this sort of thing, it's going to want to use your sort of terminal related things. So it's going to use the terminal's audio device, which it currently has none. So now if I run games, doom. So now we have the audio playing and you can see the load go up on the uh, CPU server. So yeah, that's basically running a CPU server. I now have something else on the network that can do number crunching for me rather than the terminal. And that's sort of the way that it was originally envisioned at Bell Labs. Um, keep in mind back then, we're talking about, you know, 
originally 68,000 series CPUs running at, you know, 10 or 12 megahertz. Um, the stats I've seen for the old, um, you know, MIPS, I think it was a Challenger series system used as the original CPU server was a, a quad CPU machine where the CPUs are running at 25 megahertz. Um, and so when you're dealing with things like recompiling the kernel or big programming projects, um, yeah, you could send that off as uh, something to be processed on the CPU server. Um, might not be as useful today. You know, a lot of people have pretty powerful machines that they use as terminals now. Uh, but in my next videos in this sort of little, you know, sub-series on CPU servers, I'm going to demonstrate um, using, taking the CPU server concept and using it on machines with very minimal CPUs, um, stuff you typically gets lumped in with these sort of Internet of Things type devices. Uh, and until then, have fun.